I wanted to share some of my tips and techniques that I've learned, starting with what I learned from the Tartine Bread by Chad Robertson. This is kind of the source for people who want to make a country style sourdough loaf at home using sourdough starter. So I have been making this bread following the recipes in Chad's book for about five years now. And I'm pretty happy with the results. I'll share them with you later at the end of this video, but um, just wanted to talk through some of how I do it. So first of all, I've already fed this sourdough starter. Um, sometimes people call it the mother. It's the mother of the bread, I guess. But this sourdough starter, which I fed this morning, um, is very springy, if you can see it, and it's got a lot of bubbles, and it's pretty loose, but also has some body to it. Um, usually when you have a sourdough starter, what you wanna do is um, feed it periodically if you're not baking. So I keep my sourdough starter in the fridge, and um, if I'm not frequently baking, I'll feed it maybe once a week. And by feeding it, what you're doing is you're adding more um, fuel, I guess, and the fuel is water and flour. So that actually activates the yeast and helps it um, uh, stay healthy and active. Um, to feed a sourdough starter in between baking, usually what you wanna do is about 20% starter and then 40% each of a mixture of flour and water. So um, as an example, to feed your starter just to keep it active, you might do 50 grams of sourdough starter and then 20 grams, I'm sorry, 50 grams of sourdough starter and 100 grams each of flour and water. And also, again, from the Robertson book, um, it's really important to have good flour. Um, and in particular, he recommends doing a blend of 50-50 between AP, which is all-purpose flour, and whole wheat. The whole wheat has a lot higher bran content and that actually will t lend both richness and flavor to your starter, but also I think it has more activated yeast elements. Um, but in this case, we're getting ready to make bread. And so um, I fed this to make what you call a levain for baking the bread. And to do that, you do more like a between five and 10% of starter to the 90, 80 to 90% of water and flour. Usually you want to make your water and flour equal proportions. So um, in this case, I use usually about uh, a rounded tablespoon of starter. That usually equals roughly 25 grams of uh, starter. And then I add a mixture of um, 150 grams of flour. Again, 50-50 blend of all-purpose and whole wheat and 150 grams of water. So that's gonna give me roughly 300 to 325, uh, well, I guess it gives me 325 grams of Levet. One of the things people do, especially when you're starting out, and I don't do this every time, but you wanna let that mixture rise and develop for about uh, maybe six to eight hours. So I fed mine in the morning because I knew I wanted to form my bread in the evening. And um, one of the things you can do, especially when you're new to making sourdough, is you can do what you call the float test. So you take a spoonful of your levain and you put it in a cup of water and ideally it's going to float. And let's just double check. So this is a very healthy starter that is floating. What that uh, shows is that you've developed a lot of carbon dioxide, I think, um, which helps with the floating. Um, and just shows that your starter is ready to bake with. So I don't do this test every time because now I can recognize the signs of real activity um, in my starter. The other things you can do is just, again, look at the springiness and the bubbling. You can smell it and see if you can smell that little bit of sourdough. So I'm going to mix one recipe which will make two loaves of bread. Um, I have here my food scale and a large bowl. So usually what you wanna do is add in 
200 grams of starter. So I'm going to add in about 700 grams of water. Um, I actually, one of the things um, that makes a big difference in your bread texture and the finished result, or what you call the crumb, that inner texture, is the proportion of water that you put in. So, so bakers usually um, look at their bread mixture in terms of the percent of water to flour. So a 70% hydration dough will have 700 grams of water, which is this, to 1,000 grams of flour. Uh, in my case, I've actually been playing around with adding a little bit more hydration. And so um, in this case, actually we're gonna add 50 more grams of water anyway. So this would be a recipe following the Robertson method of 750 grams of water, ultimately to 1,000 grams of flour. But I'm gonna add a little bit more because I've been going more like 80%. So I'm going to go to 950 here just to add a little bit more. Okay, um, and then what you want to do is really stir this pretty well together. And so again, what you're doing is essentially dissolving or breaking up this um, starter in the water so that it's well hydrated and it's not clumpy, okay? Once you've got it pretty well distributed, you can put it back on, back on your food scale. Um, the other thing I didn't mention when I was adding the water is I live in Colorado. It's springtime, which means actually cold. It snowed 10 inches yesterday. Um, and my house is not the warmest place and it's very dry. So that might be one of the reasons why doing high hydration is working for me. But the other thing um, that I have been doing for about the past year is using fairly warm water. So the water that I added, rather than being cold from the tap, was warm to the touch. So that means it was probably about, you know, 100 degrees, 100, 110 degrees water. Um, and I feel like having that warm water really helps with, again, just giving a really um, welcoming, warm, um, incubating environment for the bread yeasts. So now I have my 200 grams of starter and 750 grams of water, and I am going to add in my flours. So um, to this, basically I'm gonna add a combination of 1,000 grams of flour to make the two loaves. Um, I, again, people talk about how baking is a science, and it is, and you should definitely follow the measurements as strictly as possible in the beginning. But once you get the hang of it, you can kind of play around. So I usually add a combination of whole wheat, about 20% whole wheat, but sometimes I go as high as 25%. And it just depends on, you know, which flour I have more of, um, what kind of mood I'm in, do I want to have a lot of wheaty flavor, or um, just if I'm paying attention and measuring carefully. So here I'm adding closer to 250 grams of wheat flour and then um, again a couple years ago I switched to only baking my bread using bread flour and I feel like that really made a difference as well in terms of um, just the development of the gluten. So bread flour is going to have a higher gluten a higher gluten pro and protein content than an all-purpose flour. So here I'm going to fill out the rest of my um, weight to make it a total of a thousand grams of flour. So we go through a lot of flour around here. Sometimes, like in this case, I'm just barely making it. But if I was a little bit short on bread flour, then I would just fill out that last hundred grams or so with um, all purpose. So now I'm going to give it a little stir. Um, actually, I use a spoon or a spatula or something to get it going but honestly there's nothing better for mixing bread than using your hands and so of course my hands are clean I just washed them um, and what you want to do is just make sure you really get that moisture distributed I um, mean you're gonna mix it until it's pretty shaggy and you'll see what that means so that might take a minute or two and it re makes a real mess you can't really make good bread without getting sticky dough all over your hands. 
So here I'm kind of going in a little circle and I'm pulling from the bottom and squeezing it to make sure it's well distributed and making sure there aren't any pockets of moisture in there. And once it's pretty well moistened, all of the um, water seems like it's been distributed, then what we're gonna do is let it sit for a little bit. Um, this first phase, so here you can see that it's all been basically moistened. I'm gonna scrape off some of that dough into, into the bowl. Um, in some bakers, um, in Robertson's method, I think um, this section is called the autolyze. I don't really know what the etymology of that is, but basically this is hydrating the flour. Um, and one point here is right now, again, what's in the bowl is starter and water and flour. There's no salt in there yet. Um, and I honestly don't remember why it's important, but it is important to do the autolyze, which is um, giving the flour a chance to fully hydrate and really plump up before you add salt in there. So what we're gonna do is cover this with a clean dish towel and put this in a warm place. So in my house, again, as I mentioned, it's not the warmest place. Um, I usually proof my bread dough in the oven with the light on. So I don't turn the oven on, I just have the light bulb and that seems to provide a very insulated, nice warm environment and also it's not too dry in there. So we're gonna leave this. The auto lies can go for um, a minimum of 15 minutes and it can go sometimes as long as 45 minutes. So it kind of depends on what else you're trying to do, if you're in a hurry or not. Um, again, these ranges, sometimes it depends as I talk through making this bread. Um, you know, it just depends on if you have hours and hours. Bread is great to make on a weekend day when you're at home. Maybe you're reading the newspaper and having your coffee. You're catching up on reading some books. You're doing laundry, whatever it is. You don't have anywhere to go, especially in this current time of coronavirus. Um, but it is great when you have just the flexibility of time to sit around. There are times when I'm making bread, especially at night, and I don't want it to take five or six hours to make my bread because I want to go to bed. Um, and so that's where you might decide that you're only going to autolyze for 15 minutes instead of 45. Or you forget about it and you come back 45 minutes later and your flour is really plump. So I will come back once the autolyze is done. So this has been going for about half an hour. And, um, you know, again, I'm proofing it in my warm oven. You can see it's still got a little um, kind of doughy looking bits. It's not totally incorporated, but when I start um, kneading the dough a little bit, it's gonna feel like it's moistened and very whole. So at this point, I wanna add my salt. So I have 20 grams of salt. This is kosher salt. Um, and then, I have about 50 grams of water. This is actually, I, I, this one I actually do by measurement. So I have a quarter cup and again, it's warm to the touch. And so I'm gonna spread that all over. That's gonna um, kind of moisten all the salt. And then what you wanna do is really incorporate all the salt. And what I do is you kind of pull it up and you squeeze it. And that incorporates both the water and the salt in here. Now at this point, um, as you do it, you wanna make sure you're going in all directions. Um, some people will transfer this to a clean container for proofing. I never do, just another bowl to wash. So, um, but it does mean that sometimes you'll have little bits of dried flour along the side and I just leave them be. Um, so here again, I'm just giving it a good, mixture, um, making sure that I'm getting all the way to the bottom. And as I do this, you can see that already, just in at incorporating the extra 50 grams of water and 20 grams of salt, this has become a very kind of nice, kind of uh, coherent bowl of dough. But um, if you can see, it's currently filling, you know, in this bowl, 
not quite half of the bowl. Um, earlier, I might have gotten a little bit confusing because I was trying to measure and talk at the same time on my food scale. But again, I've got 200 grams of leaven and 750 grams of water. So again, I'm going just an extra 50 grams. I have an extra 5% of water in my dough. That was for the initial section, plus 1,000 grams of flour um, for a total weight in the first mixing of 1,000 950 grams of water, flour, and leavening. And at this point, I've added another 20 grams of salt and 50 grams of water. So that brings my total water to about 80%, 800 grams in total. So that was it. Um, incorporating those extra ingredients, and now I'm gonna cover it again and put it into the oven to proof again. Um, this is the beginning of what we call the bulk fermentation. Um, I just watched a video from Bon Appetit and learned from Claire Saffitz, one of my favorite YouTubers out there, um, about the bulk fermentation. The reason it's called that is again here, this is one big mass of dough that makes enough, in my case as a home baker, for two loaves of bread. I have done as many as three loaves, but it gets to be quite a volume in a home kitchen. But in a commercial kitchen, they're letting all this dough ferment together to make you know dozens and dozens, maybe even hundreds of loaves. In this section, when you're keeping all of those loaves worth of dough together, that's called fermenting it in bulk. Um, that just, I thought it was a good explanation. I've never understood why it was called bulk fermentation before. So um, at this point, I am going to actually set a reminder on my watch to come back in 30 minutes. This is the one thing that I found um, can, again, make or break your bread, is consistency in turning your dough. So um, in this style, the tartine style loaves, you're not really like kneading the bread the way that you might think of traditional bread making. You're kind of gently turning it every 30 minutes or so. And what you're doing, and I'll show you the technique in the next segment, is what we call uh, stretch and fold. And what you're doing is stretching out those gluten strands and gently letting it fall on itself so that you're maintaining the volume. You're not squeezing the air out of the dough. Um, but in the many, many times I've made bread, sometimes I forget and three hours later, I will realize that my bread has just been left to proof and overproof. And what happens is actually you get a lot of volume, but then when you go to manipulate the bread, it actually all that volume disappears because you haven't strengthened the gluten. So um, it is really important to set reminders for yourself at this point. Um, we're gonna wanna aim for about two hours total. So that first um, auto lies of 30 minutes and then addition of salt and water is considered our first 30 minutes actually of proofing. And then um, we're gonna go for another hour and a half checking in and stretching and folding that dough every 30 minutes for a total of about two hours. But we'll talk about how you know when you're done at the end of this. Sometimes it goes longer than two hours, sometimes you can be done sooner. One trick I did see on YouTube also from another baker um, is sometimes if you are in a little bit of a time crunch, let's just say I start baking at nine, and again, I don't wanna be up all night, and I wanna proof the dough a little faster, you can actually do these what we call turns just on a slightly faster schedule. So I might only autolyze in that case for 15 minutes, add the salt and extra water, and then start turning it every 20 minutes. And having that um, greater frequency in turning and stretching and strengthening can actually get your bread to develop faster. But I personally think that the results in terms of structure are still better if you go with just slightly longer turns. Um, but if you're in a rush, you can go with 15 or 20 minute turns and it still works out great. into the bulk fermentation and so we're going to do our first turn and this is one of maybe two parts of the technique that it just takes a little practice and watching other YouTube videos which I will try to link in my description uh, to really understand how to do this but um, again there's lots of different ways to do your folds and turns um, this is again instead of a more active kneading 
that you do in other types of breads and doughs. Um, and so one thing you can see even after 30 minutes of sitting, and again, my oven's pretty warm. So um, at this point, we don't really see huge signs of bubbles, but there might be one or two around the edges. And what we're gonna do is stretch the glutens all the way throughout very gently and then let it sit for another 30 minutes. Um, just to keep the dough from sticking to your hands, it's helpful to dampen your hands. So what I do is you wanna kind of really get your hand in there and grab it and pull it up. And again, I have a very high hydration here, so I'm stretching it out and putting it down. And even with damp hands, it sticks a little. And you wanna turn it a quarter turn and then again, pull it and fold it down. Get all of it to come off of your hands. And I, I can already feel that this is a little bit springy, which is nice, but there's not huge bubbles. So third side, again, I'm really trying to pull it up and develop that gluten by stretching. But you can see that in some cases at this point, it might um, actually tear a little bit because it's not super cohesive yet. And that's it. So that is the first turn and I'm gonna cover it again and let it sit for another 30 minutes. I've actually turned the bread several times, so every 30 minutes. So just showing you actually what it looks like after about two hours. So you can see actually that there are some visible large bubbles. And again, the volume has really increased because that's the air and the gases that are developing in the bread. So now we're gonna shape the bread. So you want a clean surface for this because you actually want the bread to get some tackiness on the counter. And so we're just gonna take this whole mass and put it on the counter. And um, if you want, you can use a bench scraper or something to help pull it all out of the bowl. Um, so here you have it. Put that aside. Okay, so this again is, if you remember about uh, 1900 grams of bread. And so we're gonna cut it in half using a bench scraper. Now this is maybe the trickiest part of the entire process, um, which involves shaping your initial dough. So um, in this case, I actually cut them, not quite in half, but that's partly because I have two different cast iron pots and one of them is slightly larger than the other. So this section where you're shaping the dough, now we split it, we're shaping your doughs. And what we wanna do is kind of sweep around using the tackiness of the dough itself and then you're going to pull it forward towards you so you're sweeping around and pulling it you can see that even just in a couple of rounds it's actually developed this uh, very smooth surface and that's because you're building tension in the dough and that tension is actually going to help with just um, the shape and the form of the final product. Um, sometimes in this phase, I have popped some of the larger visible surface bubbles, but that's just because I don't really like in the finished bread to have these giant air pockets right in the middle. So we're gonna do that on this one as well. Um, so again, you circle, you run your bench scraper around in a circle and you pull towards yourself to create tension in the dough and do it until you feel like um, the bread actually is sitting a little bit higher again because I proof my bread really warm I find it's very loose and springy okay so that to me feels like they're just about solid and so you can see actually I'm going to put some water again just so it doesn't stick to me but like there's a lot of springiness in this dough here um, for the shaping, you don't put flour on, on the surface because that will um, cause the bread to release from the surface and you won't be able to get that tension. And now I'm gonna cover it loosely. Sometimes you can sprinkle some flour and then just cover it again with your uh, kitchen towel and let it rest for another about 15 minutes. So it's been about 
20 minutes and the bread has rested. Um, I don't remember if I mentioned that's called the bench rest. So um, now you can see that after resting, the bread has relaxed a little bit, but there's still a nice um, tension and curvature here. If your bread is totally flat and running out like a pancake, it means it probably needs to be shaped a second time to continue to build that tension. But I think this looks pretty good. There's still kind of a general moundedness to this uh, loaf shape. So we're gonna go to the final shaping. So now I am gonna sprinkle a little bit of flour, it's just all purpose, on the top of the loaves because now we actually wanna be able to manipulate it and have it not stick to the um, surface. So one of the things at this stage um, is again, we're continuing to build the tension on the surface of the bread dough, um, but also we wanna be pretty gentle. So you're gonna see me stretch and pull this and it's gonna seem like I'm really manipulating it a lot, but at the end of the day, you're not punching it. You wanna preserve as much of that volume of air as possible in there. So you're gonna take your bench scraper and you're just gonna lift the whole thing in a motion and pull it up. Ooh, it's sticking, but that's because I have 80% hydration. So it's gonna be a little wet and you're gonna gently flip it over, okay? And so again, having a little bit of flour here to just keep from all the sticking. So now what you wanna do is sort of gently pull your bread out and you're stretching it and then you're gonna fold it to create more surface tension. So I did one fold of about a third on the way up and then I'm gonna pull and fold the right side in. You're gonna pull and fold the left side in. You're gonna kind of gently adhere these so that they stick together. And then you're gonna take this last part, and again, I mentioned the large air bubbles. So in this case, I might pop some of the really visible large ones. And here you're gonna pull this over. Okay, so now you have a seam facing up. And here, I tend to use my bench scraper to help kind of flip this over. You can see you have a nice little package of dough here and you wanna just again, use that scraper and your hands. Sometimes you might use the uh, motion of kind of gently cupping and folding it and pulling it in because again, you're trying to create overall surface tension. So I'm gonna let that one rest for a minute. That's actually more than I usually handle it. Going to the next one again, um, this is a high hydration dough. So at this point, you can use some flour just to keep it from sticking to the surface of your hands. Um, and you're gonna flip it over. And then um, you wanna kind of pull it, but gently out. You're gonna fold it up one third, then from the right and from the left. Then you wanna take this top part and fold it in. Put it on a lightly floured surface, get a little bit on your hands, and gently pull that in to just cause a nice kind of taut and tense surface. Now, I am going to let these rest again, um, and we'll talk about the schedule or cycle of bread making in a minute, but I have these nice bread baskets. These are called Benetton. And so uh, I'm sure I'm not saying that the way a French person would, but these are meant for proofing and letting dough rise. And so um, in this case, these are the same, uh, they're, they're basically reed baskets. And this one has a liner, um, this one does not. And so basically, um, in my opinion, I usually bake my bread with a liner just because um, you have more control over moisture and it doesn't stick as much. But last time I tried it with this coil one without a liner and it made a really cool pattern, which is you know aesthetically really pleasing. So um, what I'm gonna do at this point is um, I'm gonna liberally dust both of these with a mixture. This is a mixture of um, all-purpose and rice flour, it's about 50-50. So I'm gonna just spread that all over my basket and then also in my coil basket here that's unlined. Um, and I'm actually gonna kind of tap it around to make sure that that is nicely uh, distributed. So 
kind of make sure that there's good coverage throughout the basket because um, at this point you're going to let your dough sit for several hours, at least two hours or overnight, um, and that moisture will make it stick otherwise. Um, rice flour is used by most bakers at this stage because it helps with um, moisture and kind of wicking. It's much more of an absorbent flour. I'm noticing also today that uh, my division of the breads was really uneven, so this one's much larger than this one. Um, but that's okay. So I'm just gonna take these and flip them. Again, keeping that basic um, shape and flip it upside down so that the seam side is up. And same here. So I'm gonna take that and flip it in the basket. Um, sometimes I just do another little sprinkle of flour here because I don't want that bread to stick to the kitchen cloth that I'm going to lay overnight and, and let it rise. So um, at this point, again, because I am doing this bread baking in the evening, I'm gonna let these rise overnight. But if you let a dough like this rise for, you know, eight plus hours overnight at room temperature, it's gonna build a lot of lactic acid and um, the sourdough flavor will be overwhelming. And yes, it is a sourdough, but you don't want it to be that sour. So what you can do is you can um, let the final rise happen overnight in a refrigerator for eight plus hours. Um, the alternative would be to let it rest at room temperature for maybe two hours, more or less, um, and then bake them out tonight. Okay, good morning. So we've done the overnight rise in the fridge. Um, the bread loaves are still chilling in the refrigerator because I've had to turn my oven on. I just thought I'd take a minute to talk about the baking equipment. So um, to bake these loaves, you want to preheat your oven to 500 degrees or as hot as it can get. If your oven doesn't go to 500, just turn it up uh, certainly at least to 450. Um, and you want to bake your bread in a cast iron uh, covered like a Dutch oven type pot. So I happen to have two Le Crusettes. Um, these have sizes. If you look on the bottom of your pot, there's a number. This is a 24. So that's a four and a half quart pot. And this is a 22. And that makes it a three and a half quart pot. I think I mentioned yesterday that I have two different sizes. So usually I cut my dough not quite e equally and I try to put the smaller loaf in the smaller pot. The reason you want to uh, bake in a Dutch oven type pot is the, the steam that is created. So when you put your dough into your Dutch oven and you start the bake with it covered, um, the moisture in the bread will naturally create steam inside this and it will actually create what's called oven rise, which is when your dough, which will come in you know, maybe this high will actually rise quite a bit, um, very visibly as it's baking. And the steam helps with that, but it also, I think, helps harden the outer surface of the crust and create that really nice crustiness that you're gonna see in the finished product. Um, about halfway through the bake, you then take the top off and that will give the opportunity for the bread to really brown and caramelize that crust. So it's really important to preheat these pots. Um, and so I am gonna go stick these in the 500 degree oven um, and you want them to get really hot. So you don't wanna just get it to 500 and start baking right away. You wanna maybe give it another five or 10 minutes to just make sure it's really, really hot. So when we're ready for the next step, we'll resume. I heated the Dutch ovens in the 500 degree oven. So just be very mindful. Obviously this is super hot. You don't want to accidentally bump the edge of the pot or anything. Um, and I have my bread that was proofing overnight. So I'm just going to very carefully flip this into the pot. Um, hopefully it's not going to stick. Okay, this one is sticking a little. This is the one that 
has no liner. So I'm just gonna pull it away from the edges here, a little bit like that. Again, because it's very high moisture. I'm gonna give it a little flip. Boom. Okay. Oh, you didn't do cornmeal. Oh, I forgot to do the cornmeal. Thank you for reminding me. So this one will not have cornmeal on the bottom because it's too hot to pull out. But sometimes I do a little bit of cornmeal on the bottom and it just helps with a little bit of making sure that there's not any sticking. And also, of course, it gives a nice little bit of texture in the bottom of the crust. Thank you for reminding me about that. Um, and so again, with the basket with the liner, the bread will flip out much easier, as you can see. Um, and you can see that this one flipped in not quite in the middle. Again, aim is important, but it turns out it'll be fine. The bread will kind of center itself as it expands. Um, the next thing you wanna do, oh, and the one thing I forgot to mention is if you don't have special proofing baskets, you can always just use a bowl lined with a clean kitchen towel and it works just fine. It just ends up being a little bit harder to control when you're dumping your bread out. Um, another tip I've seen some people do, which maybe is a little bit safer in terms of dealing with a hot pan, is to lay out a sheet of parchment on a baking tray, flip the bread out into that, and gently lift your parchment into your Dutch oven. But uh, I find that then the paper crinkles and there's other issues with that. Now, the last thing we do is we're gonna score the bread. And there's lots of videos about how to score it. Scoring helps with making a nice, beautiful, open structure. And it also releases some of that tension that we built in that shaping process so that the bread can actually fully rise and expand. Um, I have a special tool here called a lame, which is um, basically, it's just a tool that's designed to make it easy to hold and control a razor blade. Uh, you can also use a very sharp knife. Sometimes um, in the past I've used um, kitchen shears to cut. So I have been doing just like a little circular score. Um, there's lots of different patterns. So I did one circle there and then I'm just gonna go around and I actually turn my pot as I score. And again, you just wanna be careful not to accidentally hit the edge of the pot here. And I'm on this one, I'll do another one that I learned. I think it's one of the simplest scoring patterns where you just basically make an overlapping square. And so I'll make two lines here and then I'll do two more this way. Um, I also do find, and I'll talk a little bit about timing at the end of the video, but that um, scoring chilled uh, bread that's been proofing in the fridge is just much easier. Um, if you do a uh, loaf that's been proofing at room temperature for a couple of hours during the day, the bread itself tends to just be a lot softer and it kind of catches. But I will just say I'm not the best or most skilled at scoring. So again, make sure you put your other glove on. You don't want to pick that pan up with bare hands. Um, and to get back in, uh, I have a pretty large oven, so I do two at a time. But you can also do these one at a time. And if you only have one pot, you can do it that way. Once you get the bread in, what you want to do is turn it down to 450 and let it cook for about 20 to 22 minutes. And again, this first part with the covered Dutch oven is so that you can develop steam and you'll see the bread has risen when we check in in 22 minutes. So it's been 22 minutes and I'm just gonna pull these out and so I can take the lids off. I'm just gonna get a quick peek and you can see that this bread has really filled out the pot. So we're gonna pop those back in. They're very pale and we're gonna bake them for another 20 to 25 minutes, depending on how dark you like it. It's been about 45 minutes. Um, I actually bake my bread just a little bit longer. I think it's because I, again, I'm doing the slightly higher hydration at 80%. Um, and here we are. That's loaf number one. And this is loaf number two. Look at that beautiful swirl. So you can leave them in the pot for a minute or two, but I actually like to turn them out pretty quickly so that they can get to room temp, partly because usually at this point, we're just dying to cut into them. Um, 
And the other thing I will just note, so Robertson, his recipe says to bake it 20 minutes covered and then 20 to 25 minutes uncovered. So um, again, you can see the scoring and how much the bread kind of opened up. This is that square, what you call window pane. Um, I would actually even potentially go a couple minutes more to get a really dark crust. Some of the you know, fine dining restaurants, they have an almost blackened bread, but this will make a really nice crusty loaf. Um, and then you can see in this loaf here, this is the one that we proofed in a basket without a liner, and you can see some of these little streaks of flour that are markings from the basket, and that was that double circle scoring. That one was a little bit off center again because of the way I put it in the pot. So I'll be back again once the bread is cold so that we can cut into it and show you the inside. So we're gonna cut it open and take a look. Um, I, with these large round bowls, I like to cut it in half and then slice them uh, crosswise just for shape. Um, my daughter Maya got me this awesome cutting board that is a crumb catching cutting board and it also is helpful in this situation to have a really good knife. Um, and I'm gonna have to pick up the dog in a minute because it's his birthday and he's being super annoying, but also delightful. Okay, buddy, just a minute. So here we have the finished loaf. That is a pretty good crumb. I, obviously I talked about the large air pockets, which I did not uh, pop all of clearly because there's a huge one right here. But um, I think that's a pretty good result. We're gonna cut it again and put some butter on it. Um, this bread is fantastic, of course, when it's hot out of the oven, but it's also great. Um, it can keep for several days loosely wrapped um, and you can toast it to just revive the texture. Um, I've heard some people make grilled cheese sandwiches or other things, but honestly around here, we just eat it with good butter. Um, we just came into some of this French organic or bio butter. This butter has something like 83% fat, which makes it ultra luscious and creamy. So I'm gonna do that. Um, and then because this is unsalted, I'm just gonna give it a good little sprinkle, a pinch of kosher salt or flaky salt. You know, one of my favorite bakers out there, Dominique Ansel, the founder of The Cronut, he talks in his cooking and baking books about time being an element. And I think that's no, no more true than in baking sourdough. Um, and one of the things that it took me a while to figure out and master was the schedule. So I actually have some tips that I can share um, that I've written out about the timing. But I always think about sourdough as taking basically 24 hours from when you start feeding your starter to when you end up with finished bread. So in this example, um, I fed my starter yesterday morning, let it um, foment all day for about six to eight hours. And then the active part of making the bread is usually probably roughly three to four hours, depending on how long you spend with the rise. But again, um, once your levain is strong, you can uh, start mixing the dough. From the minute you mix the dough um, to when you put it in the fridge for an overnight rise, again, it's about four hours. Let it rise overnight, turn the oven on first thing in the morning, um, pull your proofed dough out when your oven is hot. Um, and bake it for about 40 to 50 minutes, depending on um, probably humidity, the moisture level, the temperature of your oven, a few other things, but roughly 45 to 50 minutes. So we started yesterday, now it's um, late morning and we have fresh bread. If you wanna have your bread in the evening, say as part of your dinner meal, um, you can do the same thing. You can feed your starter last thing before you go to bed the night before. 
get up in the morning and do the active parts of your dough for about four hours in the morning, let it rise. In that case, if you're not rising overnight, then you can leave it out in a, you know, kind of moderately warm or um, room temperature place for two to four hours um, and then bake it. So um, again, I have notes on that kind of schedule. Um, letting your sourdough rise um, in the final proofing stage for more than about four hours at room temperature is really going to affect the sourness and the lactic acid buildup. Um, and you actually can really overproof your bread and it actually loses some of that structure and form. So I don't recommend that. Um, so that's it. Hope that was helpful. Happy bread making. If you need starter, let me know and uh, support the USPS. Thank you.